four million years later. Hi there. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast. This is a show where a couple of friends, longtime friends, get together and watch an episode of the Generation One Transformers cartoon series in story order and then convene to talk about what they saw. We grew up with the show. We were children when it came out on television in the 80s. We loved it then. We loved it well into our teens and our early adulthood, and we love it still today. And the lens that we look at the show through is the perspective of how we engaged with it as children and how we reflect on it today as adults. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... Hoover, arise out of bed. It's time to podcast. (laughs) That's true. This is one of the first things you do in the day. Sadly, and it wasn't engineered (laughs) to be that way, but life throws you curveballs. Yeah, we work with what we've got. You know, we adapt. We sort of scan new forms to take... (laughs) Like I scan the <laughs> the the form of Daywalker to continue this podcast, and then returns to his primary state, land slug, mm-hmm. for sure. <laughs> that pathetic flesh creature. So yeah, every week we show up and talk about another episode. We're on the twenty fourth episode in story order. If you're going off of your DVDs or Tubi.tv, this is not the order that you will see. But, you know, every episode we tell you what the next episode is going to be that we cover. And Hoover very graciously posted the story order that we're following on the 4 Million Years Later Facebook page. So join us there, too. So you can question, comment, reflect, and interject, and all other kinds of words that Soundwave might use. So <laughs> what what's our episode this week? This week, it's Atlantis Arise by Douglas Booth. Hey, Douglas Booth. That means there's going to be a lot of stuff happening in this one and lots of little teams. Oh, there definitely was a lot of stuff happening. If you're looking for this one on Tubi, it's going to be considered episode nine of season two. So it just occurred to me this week to sort of give you a clue about where to find it on Tubi because sometimes they are way different than what we're doing. So... We'll give you a hint on where to find it. Thank you for that. Another service provided by Hoover. Mm-hmm. So, Douglas Booth, why did, why did we get so excited when we heard his name, if people are just tuning into this episode? Well, we've listened to a number of episodes he's written so far, such as Roll For It. We loved mm. that one. Fire on yep. the Mountain. That might be my favorite, favorite of season one. Yeah. A Plague of Insecticons. Pretty good. And also City of Steel, but hey, no one can bet 1,000. <laughs> It's the exception that proves the rule. (laughs) All right, so here comes the log line for this episode. The Decepticons discover an underwater city in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and make friends with its people. Well, that's nice. (laughs) Now they're... (laughs) They make friends. I've been waiting for this episode. (laughs) I love that scene where they all start dancing with each other and holding hands. Oh, don't, don't even, don't, don't say it unless you mean it or my heart will break. Continuing the log line. Now they're out to destroy the surface world. Oh, so it's not about friendship after all. It's about unholy alliances. So top level view, just to brace everybody. I suspect that we might be unfolding a pattern as we re-engage with the show in a more attentive and thoughtful way is This is the second time where it's a show that I remember watching as a child. I remember watching it in my 20s and, you know, early 30s, revisiting these episodes again and again and feeling like they're pretty good. That was a good episode. Traitor. I was like, yeah, that was a good episode. Then I watch it for this project. I'm like, hey, actually, it's a really good episode. Mm. And I feel like Atlantis Arise is another one where it's like if you would ask me a year ago, I'd be like, yeah, it's it's a pretty good one. There's some neat stuff that happens in it. Mm -hmm. But watching it again, I'm like, God darn, there's some really great stuff in this one. Yeah, I I would agree. It's like a lot of times it seems like my old memories are based on sort of like the log line or the plot. Like, oh, yeah, that was the one Mm -hmm. with with the Subatlanticans. That that was okay. You know, it's like I'm not remembering the ins and outs and details and sort of like the analyzation of the writing. Mm -hmm. But when I'm watching it for this purpose, a lot of times, you know, some of the episodes that i thought before were "Eh, that's okay 
you know, some of the details sort of float to the surface, like uh, Carly's first appearance we've recently watched. Mm -hmm. That was definitely one of those cases. So it's always a fun thing to experience when you're like, okay, I sort of went in thinking this was just going to be okay, but turns out it's really good. Yeah, yeah, this one has so many really beautiful moments as far as like the the staging and the compositions and the shots and uh, color too. There's some really lovely painted backgrounds in this one. And also just like some of like the the staples that we look for is like as we start to like try to chart out what uh, a platonic ideal of a Transformers episode is. Mm -hmm. This has a lot of those ingredients. So speaking of, how does this one begin? Well, the very first thing we notice is Victor Caroli is back. All right. And he informs us that the Decepticons just made an ominous discovery. And that's it. <laughs> no elaborate explanation of the plot or setting. Just one little sentence. But I'll take it. In their relentless pursuit of more energy, the Decepticons make an ominous discovery. Yeah, it's like... If you have Victor Curley's voice, like you don't need to do any more tone setting than that. Right, right. right. It's like it's like uh, the Decepticons, and I just said it. The Decepticons. <laughs> don't you feel it? Don't you have goose flesh? Yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to think of like what is the first cartoon to really sort of set the scene with a narrator, and would it be Super Friends? Do you think? Rushing through the jungles of Bornego to the scene of danger, the world's greatest archer, staunch member of the Justice League of America, the Green Arrow. Well, that's one of the first ones I think of, but I kind of have to wonder if some of those old Hanna-Barbera, Space Ghost, those mm. shorts, I wonder if they had some of that. But yeah, I think of Super Friends, I think of the old Filmation superhero shows from like the 60s. <laughs> Toward planet Earth streaks a strange remote-controlled missile plunging through the stratosphere. It plants itself in the rock-strewn terrain of the isolated mountainous wasteland. Aquaman. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's true. That's That definitely predates, Ted Knight. predates uh, Super Friends. So, I mean, there's a little bit of that. I, I want to say even going back to the old serials, like the adventure serials from the movie theaters way back when, but you could see like a direct line sometimes with these stories with those old serials as well. Like you can tell that these writers grew up on a lot of that stuff. And oh, they'll even yeah, say it 100%. in interviews. Like you watch The Crimson Ghost, which I highly recommend to anybody who enjoys mm -hmm. Sunbow shows. Me Go too. watch The Crimson Ghost. Yes. Who are you? I'm known to the police and the FBI as the Crimson Ghost. <laughs> Under my influence, you will relinquish your willpower and become my slave. But uh, you will see that, like, oh, this is what the G.I. Joe guys were working with, uh, <laughs> or working from as source material. Yeah, it's basically it. So, Victor Curley makes us all feel comfortable and engaged and excited about a cool adventure. <laughs> and what is the next thing we see? Well, the second thing that we notice is Buzzsaw is back. We see both hey. he and Laserbeak both flying through the air en route to back to headquarters. Which made me wonder something briefly and sent me down a sort of little mental rabbit hole. And that rabbit hole was trying to recollect whether they ever referred to Laserbeak or Buzzsaw as him. Mm -hmm. And for a good 60 seconds there, I was like, wait a minute. Have we just been assuming that Laserbeak and Buzzsaw were male all this time? Mm. And I tried to think of all the times they'd been referred to in the show, and I couldn't recall any time they were gendered at all. It was just like, laser beak is this, buzzsaw is that, you know, <laughs> so, stuff like that. But then mm. I pulled up both their original text specs, and of course it's he and him all over the place. But for a few mm. seconds there, I thought maybe I somehow uncovered a crazy possibility, but I should have known that there aren't all that many mysteries left about a 36-year-old cartoon, so... Oh, well. <laughs> I didn't unearth any treasure, but you can't fault me for digging. Yeah, well, that's what we do here. I can think of one line. It was, divide and conquer. Megatron says to Laserbeak, oh, this is so sad. I can recite this. He's like, go go to Autobot headquarters and learn the true state of Optimus Prime. And Laserbeak flaps his wings. And Skywarp says, I think Laserbeak's chicken. And Megatron mm -hmm. says, he'll have more to fear if he doesn't. Oh, that's obey. right. You're right. So. Yep, my brain is broken. So, okay, so <laughs> the, the two boys, the two boy bird Decepticon <laughs> tapes are flying to Decepticon headquarters. Mm -hmm. Well, just while I'm on that topic briefly, I would like to say that mm -hmm. I think the concept of gendered robots is 
silly and doesn't really make much sense to begin with, but that's too big an mm-hmm. issue to unpack here. And we're definitely going to touch on that later in the series definitely. where we start to see some girl robots. Quote unquote. Yeah. So, okay. Moving on. So we cut to Decepta Town under the sea and we get what I think is a first. Megatron is yelling at Soundwave. How dare you disturb me to watch a travelogue, Soundwave? Recall Laser Beacon Buzzsaw at once. With Megatron and Absurd. Are you interested now? Yes! An underwater city of such size must generate enormous energy. Energy that shall soon be ours. And without another word, Megatron walks out of the room, followed by Soundwave and the Three Seekers, and everyone departs the base. Yes, kids, it's another let's steal energy plot. (laughs) But what I do like about this exchange is Soundwave's confidence. This is really the first time we've ever seen Megatron yell at him. And he doesn't cower or apologize. He's just certain that Megatron will like what he's found. And he's right. Yeah. Soundwave's a good life partner. You know, he's like, he's (laughs) like, okay, I don't need to get swept up in whatever Megatron's got going on right now. Uh, I'll just let him play it out. And then he'll see that I'm, you know, I'm not trying Mm -hmm. to hurt him. I'm just trying to help him. Yep. (laughs) So they all rendezvous with Buzzsaw and Laserbeak. And then the pair enter Soundwave's chest. And an interesting note here. Megatron says, Your cassette vultures have done well, Soundwave. They're referred to as vultures, and I always thought they'd been described as condors. So I looked it up, and guess what? Condors are vultures. I didn't know that. So no error here, and I've learned something. So Megatron dives into the sea below in search of this energy-rich city. And the Decepticons follow. Megatron lands on the ocean floor and observes this sprawling city complete with underwater fires, which I definitely don't understand. But the Seekers keep on heading towards this city, which troubles Megatron. Starscream, wait! Wait, he is for killing zap mice! (laughs) Oh, does somebody have boom glitches in their brain garage? (laughs) <laughs> oh, Might need boy. to call the exterminator for the zap mice in your brain garage. Zap <sighs> mice. Good gravy. We've yeah. we've now heard of a good half dozen type of what I can only presume are robotic animal creatures that we never, ever see on Cybertron. <laughs> so are we to assume zap mice and turbo foxes live on other worlds that they've encountered? Or are there just really good exterminator services on Cybertron? And they literally wiped all them out? I don't know. Are they just off screen 100% of the time? For as often as these things come up, you'd think we'd see something. But I digress. Well, let's let's hang on to this digression just for a second, because I do think this is worth pointing out that the later Transformers series, in particular Transformers Prime, kind of addresses this notion of, yeah, there's different species of creature living on Cybertron, like incorporating some of the uh, comic book continuity with like the scraplets, is that what they're called? Mm -hmm. Those little saw-mouthed rodent creatures that eat all Cybertronians. Then you have the Insecticons, which are like kind of a different species of Transformer. So it's like, yeah, I kind of wish that with all of the name dropping they're doing of all these different kind of animals, I wish we would see something else on Cybertron besides humanoid robots. Actually, taking a step back later on in season two, we're going to meet some kind of weird other Cybertronians like what, what, what is that guy Deceptitran we're going to meet later oh on, boy right? he's, yeah <laughs> but but I mean like it, it suggests it you know and it's like yeah it, it's one of those things that as we kind of go back and forth on this pushing back and forth I think a little bit is in that like I think showing up to a television show where everything is just sort of presented as this has been going on a long time and you just catch up kid I enjoy that but like you were the kid who's like, why are all these characters walking on as if they've always been here, right? Mm-hmm. How come they don't get an origin story? I feel like this is one where we can both agree that if you're going to keep talking about them, we should see some right. of them at yeah. some point or another. Let, let's have some proof that they <laughs> exist other than people talking about them. <laughs> and it would be such a cool way to enrich some of the sort of lore of Cybertron because Cybertron largely is like just like this dead metal planet they go to every once in a while but we outside of some building of the mythology in terms of Vector Sigma and things like that and Alpha Trion we don't get a lot of sense of like what what is the culture there 
right? Like what, mm-hmm. what, was, what was the, what was it like living there in the golden age? Yeah. I know there's a couple examples, but like it just, it points to that and it feels like that would be a cool thing to do a little bit of extra world building, but oh well, okay. Now digression over. So <laughs> what, what is, what is Starscream doing? What's he doing this time? Well, he's being impulsive as ever and naturally his impulsiveness is going to cause a problem. And it does as the three seekers collide with a force field around the city causing Megatron to point out that rushing forward blindly is for adults. <laughs> then we see a roughly human-sized stranger emerge, a yellow-eyed, green-skinned, bipedal creature who introduces himself. You speak wisely, land stranger. I am Nergil, king of Subatlantica. Welcome to my domain. So this weird battle beast looking guy <laughs> comes out. I mean, he, the armor really does feel like battle beast armor in a way. Uh, he's got like, like like these metal underpants and like these <laughs> like cool design shoulder pads. But his name is Nergil, which if I could be a, a nerd for a second, they're not making a reference here to Warhammer 40K. This is actually to, <laughs> uh, it, it's a clever punny name because he's he's a fish guy. So it's Nergil, as in that's mm-hmm. how he breathes with gills. But it's a, a, a reference, I think, to Nurgle, the ancient Mesopotamian god. Check out the big brain on bread. So Nurgle was uh, a deity that was worshipped throughout ancient Mesopotamia, uh, Assyria, Babylonia, with the main seat of his worship at Kutha, represented by the mound of Tel Ibrahim. Other names for him are Era and Era. So there's a little bit of history, kids, in case you wanted it. Nerd! Homer, that isn't very nice. Wow, so now we're going to rename Jersey Nerdgill. <laughs> it's, you know, the, the, it's like you just pointed out earlier how like this show taught us that condors are vultures, you know? And it's like, mm-hmm. it's one of those things that I feel like underlining whenever I can is that these writers were not hacking this stuff out, you know? Yeah. It's like one of the main things people say as adults when they talk about stuff in their childhood is like, oh, it was, it was such a dumb idea. Orko, what a, what a horrible thing. You know, Snarf, oh gosh, it's like the Wesley Crusher of the Thundercats. <laughs> it's like, you know, th- these things are thought through and they're trying to make this stuff actually like interesting for children. And this is the kind of stuff like when I would learn, like when I'm learning my, in my humanities class that I discovered this guy, this guy named Nergil, and I'm like, wait a minute. And mm-hmm. it, that's like that guy from that show I like, you know? <laughs> so it's like, it, it made me remember the name for crying out loud. So, so there we go. <laughs> Well, as Nurgle talks, we see a jewel on his crown glow as we see it project out waves from it, which traditionally in animation represents a sort of telepathy, as often used in Aquaman cartoons. Now, from Aquaman's brain, telepathic emanations fan out through the deep, summoning a giant sea turtle. Then, just to hit the point home, Soundwave exclaims, (laughs) But he's speaking telepathically. (laughs) And yeah. remember that we've seen Soundwave read Chip's mind before, so he's got some telepathic experience, which has never really gone into very heavily, but clearly it's there. But clearly this is just to get out in front of all the smart kids who are ready to go, Hey, how's he talking underwater? Why mm-hmm. doesn't he sound like... <laughs> <laughs> like Merman. Yeah. Now, as far as Nurgle's voice artist, IMDb's trivia section says it's actually voice director Wally Burr providing the voice himself. Mm. And it's pitched way down, so without manipulating it, it's really hard to discern. Mm. So here's what it sounds like when you manipulate it. You speak wisely, land stranger. I am Nurgle, king of Subatlantica. Welcome to my domain. So Soundwave exclaims that Nurgle's mental power is great, leading Starscream to retort, Not as great as my firepower! <laughs> but before he can even get a shot off, Nurgle's troops shoot Starscream, causing him to fall to the ocean floor. This affront irks Nurgle, who threatens Megatron with destruction, but what you don't do is threaten Megatron. So Megatron fires at all the outcropping above Nurgle, causing it to come raining down upon him as Megatron exclaims, Boastful manfish! <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> so then Nurgle and his troops are buried in all the rock, but Megatron unearths them, calling them foolish but spirited, 
and exclaiming that they have much to offer one another. And then Nurgle turns to his lieutenants and telepathically exclaims, He scrambled the message star screen. Then unscramble it. I don't trust that humanoid anchovy. Now you can, if you listen to, and I, I listened very carefully to every time Nergil does this in the episode, and you can actually hear him say something about lowering your weapons to his troops. Like if you've listened very carefully, you can just barely make it out in there. Mm-hmm. The later telepathic exchanges, I can't make it out. I can't hear what he's actually saying. But yeah, I, I thought that was cute. Like it was one of those things where I feel like I'm, I'm pointing to like production value on this episode. If they were really hacking it in. They would just had somebody go up to a microphone going, blah, 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 you right. know, and like yeah. just like pitch it, right? But instead, like they spoke the line and then they actually manipulated it so mm-hmm. that like careful listeners can tell that he's saying words, even though you know it's like the Decepticons sort of underline that for us again. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to digitally manipulate what Nurgle said and place it right here. So there we can see what he really was saying telepathically, but only really fast. <laughs> yeah, it was actually, yes, he was just he's the, the precursor to the Micro Machine Man, John Machida, who we'll talk about <laughs> later on in the in the series. He's an early competitor of John Mashita. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they think about it for a second, and the nerd girl's like, oh, okay, maybe we could work together, right? <laughs> yeah, he thinks that maybe a team-up is in order, and he invites them into the city, where they become friends. <laughs> oh, see, now I'm just disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they really become business partners. Yeah. But Nurgle invites them in and shows them video of a city on a conveniently Decepticon-sized view screen <laughs> and showing them all the power that the city generates. As you can see, my kingdom abounds in energy. But to use it, my people must remain deep beneath the sea. Then we will remain here too, long enough to take it from you. <laughs> uh, Megatron... <laughs> You're talking out loud, like, like right next to Nurgil. <laughs> you said the loud part quiet, the quiet part loud, Megatron. <laughs> <laughs> Nurgil should have been all, long enough to what? And Megatron retorts, uh, I said long enough to bake bread with you. I, fi- I found this great Pinterest recipe I want to share. <laughs> yeah, so then he does shifty eyes back and forth. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously he's thinking, like, this is... I, I don't know why they bothered to animate his mouth. They should have had it just be, like, the echoey thing where we hear his thoughts, right? Yeah, I mean, but, probably because they rarely ever show thoughts in this cartoon. Like, the animators mm-hmm. didn't get that. And they're like, well, yeah. it, it, there's a line here. We need to animate his mouth. So, right. might have been that. I don't know. Yeah, it, that does stand out. Is Megatron is standing right? Next to it. Also, I feel like the show is the, the Sunbow cartoons are kind of prescient in that, like a sign of status and excess is the biggest screen in town, right? Like, you just like mm-hmm. look how big my TV is, right? That I'm the king of sub <laughs> sub Atlantica, so of course I have you seen my lieutenant's TVs? Very small. <laughs> <laughs> So now we cut scenes and time has passed. They're now producing energon cubes from the strange underwater fires. So Megatron is pointing out how helpful they've been in that now they have a store of energon cubes. They needn't continue staying under the sea. They can now take over the surface world together. And it's only now, almost four full minutes into the show, that we cut to the Autobots. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about that. Like, you got to be loving this, that we haven't seen one... One lick of gears or cliff jumper or huffer <laughs> this entire time. It's been all bad guys all the time. Yeah, I can't say I really love the. F- it just seemed a little unbalanced. Like, I feel we could have cut to the Autobots before, but I don't know. We'll see. Well, I feel like this next scene, they make up for the lost. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Did you, did you miss the silliness that is the Autobots? Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the first thing they show us is Spike in a football uniform. And we know it's Spike because it says Spike across the front. <laughs> He's playing football with Autobots and Dinobots. Mm -hmm. Yes, it seems they've actually let the Dinobots out of the cave closet for once. And we're looking at a Dinobot versus Autobot football game with Spike on the Autobot side. It's a pretty amusing 30 second scene and I do recommend that you watch it. I'm not going to play by play it for you and explain who passes to who. <laughs> but soon Wheeljack is calling them all inside on the double as Prime has discovered something via Teletran 1. I love this scene like so much. Like this is a scene that I completely forgot about when mm -hmm. I'm thinking about this Me episode. Too. I think about I mostly think about Act 3 whenever I think of this episode, the whole attack on Washington and so on. But this scene was just so charming because it's like, well, how else would children think about what it'd be like to live with Transformers, right? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't describe either of us as particularly sporty kids, right? <laughs> but <laughs> that is the most true statement you have ever made. <laughs> I am I'm hedging here, but I'm guessing, yes, neither of us were terribly sporty. But, you know, when you're in elementary school, I mean, especially where I went to school, our team was called the Aggies. We were an agricultural school. It was like football was it. That was like the biggest deal in town. Like the school heroes were not in, you know, they weren't the mathletes. They were the football kids. So sports was like a part of life. As, as a child it was around me all the time you know mm -hmm. so like yeah what am i gonna do i'm hanging out with dinobots well let's play football <laughs> and yeah it's 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 charming it's so sweet and like they're using their car modes and their robot modes and their dinosaur modes to all do things with the football it's so fun and i do love that spike has a jersey that says spike <laughs> because I'm imagining that like Teletran one manufactured it for him, you know? And it's like, well, I see that they put names on there. What's Spike's last name? I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. Okay. Just put Spike on it. <laughs> and Spike just, he just wears it. Cause he's like, yeah, they mean well, but they make better decisions when I'm around. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so Prime's like, get in here. There's trouble. And Teletran is reading a mysterious energy flare from the deepest part of the Atlantic. And Prime wants volunteers to investigate. And Hound retorts it's likely safer than playing football with Dinobots. So a small team of Hound, Bumblebee, Brawn, and Wheeljack head out. Spike runs after them, determined to go along, and Bumblebee lets him in. Mm. So the four Autobots then arrive to the coordinates and simply drive into the ocean as <laughs> Hound unleashes a roof of sorts to make his vehicle form watertight as he enters the sea. And they all just sort of sink to the ocean floor and start driving on it. Spike emerges from Bumblebee in a Speedo and Scuba gear as the four <laughs> Autobots transform. Versatile Spike. Also, this is what I was thinking of uh, in an earlier episode when I was talking about how when they did underwater scenes, you see in season one and in Ultimate Doom, when they're swimming, everybody's colored in different shades of blue. That's gone now. Now mm -hmm. they're underwater, but they're all painted their base colors. So yeah. it's still the the animation and the drawings and the, the, the compositions are just gorgeous in this one. But it's like that's that stands out. Yeah. Well, now they all stare in awe at this underwater city in front of them as Spike tells them the legend of Atlantis. But no time for learning as some of Nurgil's men come out in these vehicles and begin firing upon the, quote, land slugs. Land slugs. <laughs> Flesh creatures and land slugs. <laughs> what was it? It was boastful manfish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's such a great, a great slur. <laughs> boastful manfish. Okay, so yeah, they, they're under attack. So a fight breaks out as we cut to the Decepticons, where Soundwave proclaims that he's detected Autobot presence, causing the Seekers to head over and attack. Spike declares that they've got to get back and warn Prime, but I guess they're too far underwater to radio here. And Wheeljack says yeah. he'll hold them off while the others escape. So then Soundwave joins the fight and launches Buzzsaw and Laserbeak out to join as Braun throws a sub weapon at Starscream, hitting him and causing him to crash into the ocean floor. Is that what he was doing there? Because like, when I was watching it, I was like, why are like the Autobots using tridents all of a sudden? But, like, <laughs> the sub have these rifles that like have like a, a, a well, a Neptune-like trident at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And so like when the Autobots are throwing it later on, I'm like, what, did they like take special water weapons down <laughs> under the sea? But okay, so that, that clears up for me. Thank you. <laughs> 
O'Bron is now retreating, calling for Wheeljack to join them, but he knows he can't catch up to them in time. So instead, he fires his missile at the cave that the others have retreated into, I guess ensuring the Decepticons can't follow after them? I uh, guess, it seems yeah. kind of strange. Because <laughs> like, all it's going to take is, like, you, you know we got Rumble and Frenzy, right? We'll just have them like, pound the ground and they'll open up and they'll just go in there, right? Yeah. But okay. <laughs> I mean, because, uh, well, I mean, I think Megatron's ready to point out Wheeljack's mistake here. <laughs> so Megatron arrives, points his fusion cannon at Wheeljack and exclaims, Foolishly gallant Wheeljack, your selfless action will cost you your function cycle. So here's another case of Megatron calling an Autobot by name, and it certainly makes sense that of all of them, Wheeljack would be known, given the numerous inventions of his that <laughs> Megatron has tried to steal. Right, yeah. I mean, immobilizer, anybody? <laughs> so yeah. So then Nergil tells Megatron that he wants Wheeljack as his prisoner, and Megatron agrees to this as Nergil sends a telepathic message to his men. <laughs> Oh, a warning to my guards to watch the prisoner. Nothing more. Nothing more, eh? The truth, Soundwave. Take the Autobot to my laboratory. We'll use him to develop weapons against his comrades and against our Decepticon allies. What was that communique? I always like that line for some reason. I don't know. I don't know why. I guess just because, <laughs> because communique is such a uh, highfalutin it's, kind of word. Yeah, it's not. A, it's not a word you use on the playground, right? It's like yeah. uh, I, I'm passing you a note. You mean a communique? <laughs> oh, stop it! <laughs> like, like that's what like nine year old John Mulaney would say to somebody, right? You don't hear that in regular <laughs> conversation. But also, I just love how like they play it back. And it's like, he's clearly plotting against them. And they're like, okay, but let's just keep it cool. Let's we'll keep playing along with this for now. They don't like like immediately jump down his throat, right? Because I guess yeah. like they need to... They, there's more elements to Megatron's plan yet. So time passes and Nergo gives the order for the city to rise via some hydro thrusters on the bottom. So it begins <laughs> floating up towards the surface. We cut to the three fleeing Autobots who have emerged to the surface and start driving on water again using those crazy water skis Wheeljack made for, I believe, the third time. Hmm. Subatlantica emerges out of the ocean behind them and begins firing on the Autobots as we head into our first commercial break. Okay, this episode also has a couple of really good commercial break moments to end on. Like that shot of the Autobot cars surfing on the water at the camera while this mm -hmm. giant city is behind them shooting lasers all over the place. That's an yep. exciting image. Yeah, that's nice. It's really nice. And another thing, before we distract ourselves with uh, some product placement and, mm -hmm. you know, rampant commercialism, is, like, this episode just, like, sort of takes it for granted. Like, Megatron just, like, walks in and assumes that Nurgle doesn't like where he lives. He's like, we'll take over the land. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, like it, it, I would just have loved, like, at least a moment where Nurgle's like, what, you don't like my place? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just this assumed right from the start that, like, they want the surface. Well, I guess if they're, like, warlords, I guess they would want to conquer and take more stuff. Yeah, I but, think that's the assumption more so than anything. It's like... I want to conquer things. Surely you want to conquer things. Yeah. In that's Megatron's it, mind, right? the only reason people don't <laughs> conquer things is they don't have the power or energy to do it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a pretty good observation, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's his worldview. That's how he sees things, peace through tyranny. So, like, what? You're not tyrannical? Uh, you must be a wimp, right? Because <laughs> anybody with strength would be tyrannical. That's just what you do, you know? So, yeah. Well, while we ponder the fate of... Hound and Bumblebee and Brawn and Spike. Maybe, you know, sometimes it, it helps me to manage stress by getting doing something physical, doing something just with my body. <laughs> so how about we go into the backyard for a wild, wet ride? Oh, you mean with slip, slip and slide. Okay, everybody. <laughs> did you have that when you were a kid? <laughs> I did. I remember it not working as advertised. <laughs> My parents thought that they could get around getting us one by putting a tarp in the backyard and spraying hose water on it. And I don't know if you've, if you've ever tried sliding on a tarp, but it's not smooth. <laughs> so we got all sorts of like friction burns in that thing. And plus, our yard was really bumpy. So like you had to have a really smooth yard for that thing to work. We had a whole bunch of rocks and things under the ground. So it's like you're, 
you're getting scuffed around in this tarp and you're bouncing around, you know? It's like so the uh the generic version does not work as advertised either. <laughs> I had a real version and it didn't work as advertised, so that's no but, no surprise. For those who don't know what we're talking about, it was basically it was a sheet of rubber that you put in your yard. You put water yeah. on it and you just run and slide on it. <laughs> just like imagine like, you know, like the thickness of a poster, but it was kind of this <laughs> plasticky, rubbery substance. And when you got it wet, it got slippery. So <laughs> what they showed you in the commercials is all these kids like diving onto this thing and then they would go sliding towards the end but yeah maybe if you were a fat kid like i was <laughs> you had too much gravity pulling down on you and you <laughs> jumped onto the thing and didn't really slip or slide anywhere because gravity had just had that big of a hold on you <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like <laughs> I, I also just love like that if you put a jingle to any product, what is mm -hmm. this thing? It's a sheet of rubber. What are you doing? You slide around on it. Well, that's not very compelling. Well, no. why is this slip? <laughs> then we're like, right. I'm in. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's that's Slinky in a nutshell. I mean, what would Slinky be if not for that song? That's true. What that is it? Earworm. Oh, it's a it's a spring. Oh, really? <laughs> that doesn't sound like a fun toy. Just wait. Listen to this. You know, yeah, that's so. right. And the '80s was. Uh, it was the period for for commercial jingles, and honestly, I miss it, and I wish they would come back, but clearly they're very... Uh, Out of fashion. Well, that too, but I mean, like, they clearly manipulate you when you hear them. You're like, oh, oh yeah, that sounds yeah. great, and well, maybe it, the product isn't that great. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, okay, so maybe gravity is not your friend, but I mean, you know, it, you can defy gravity by dancing around Wilbur the water pup as he splashes <laughs> us with water coming out of his body. <laughs> he's wet. He's wild. He's Wilbur the water pup. Wilbur the water pup. And another thing the 80s did really well is they found ways to incorporate sprinklers into fun yeah. toys. It's like, well, it just. Hook up a hose to this plastic dog or whatever, and it'll shoot water out water. Your lawn. No, kids love shooting out water. <laughs> well, we kind of did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the summer, especially if you lived in a hot place, it was fun to play in the water. So I remember yeah. a numerous amount of various kind of sprinklers. Like some of them are even so simple as sort of this stick that you plugged <laughs> into the ground, and at the top, it had like Spider Man's head. <laughs> like literally like only three inches tall but then there were yeah. like holes in the top of the head so yeah. it's like it would just spray out water in a, a little radius that you could play yeah. under it's like yeah that, that was as simple as toys were back in the 70s and 80s so yeah <laughs> but you know what hey it's time for us to dry off you can give me those swim trunks i loaned you uh, <laughs> where we're going outside and we can continue to enjoy some nautical fun with Battleship. Hmm. Dad says... You sank my Battleship. And history is made. Battleship and electronic Battleship from Milton Bradley. It's a hit. I don't think a lot of kids today would enjoy this very much, but I guess the concept is still there. But no, I think I, th I think it would still work. Like the strategic aspect of like the guessing game that you're playing, and like whether or not your opponent is telling the truth. I mean, that that still feels like it's a that's a timeless kind of contest. But we got to get back to the show. So let's see. Speaking of battleships, there's a city that's an entire battleship that's <laughs> heading towards land. Well, Subatlantica's rising has caused immense tides, knocking the Autobots off of their skis and sending them crashing up to the beach. Bumblebee says they need to radio Prime right away as an odd little radar device emerges from his shoulder. Yeah. It's like like a little like mini radar tower comes out of his shoulder. Yeah. Right? And it's like we've never seen this thing before. <laughs> and oh. it just seems it seems oddly complex given that this is the first time we've seen it. But mm. And using this device, he deduces that Subalantica is headed for Washington, D.C. <laughs> so then Megatron proclaims that Washington, D.C. is their first step in conquering the world. The Decepticons fly ahead as Nurgil enters his headquarters, where he offhandedly remarks that once the Decepticons conquer the humans, Nurgil will conquer the Decepticons. But what do we see inside Nurgil's HQ but Starscream, who has stayed behind to spy? 
Now, it's not depicted very well because it's pretty much a big empty room and there isn't really anything for a giant robot to hide behind. But hey, <laughs> maybe Nurgil sees very differently from most creatures. It could be. I, I, Starscream is basically just like hiding behind like this giant like lump of machinery <laughs> and and he's like way off to the right like you just you only see him for like a second or so whereas i feel like if this was shot a little bit more clearly we would have seen maybe like starscream way more in the foreground like like more of a shadowy lump we'd see nurgil walking uh, in the distance as mm -hmm. the 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 shadowy form frames the shot and then we would see starscream's face and then they would do the little thing where like the the sparkle happens in his eye you know yeah. the, the, like the, the sunbow way of saying i'm thinking <laughs> but, but it, it's fine but what's also I'm, I'm pretty sure that the moment before we see this scene too when megatron's like saying like oh we're gonna take over washington dc i'm pretty sure starscream's with him too so it's like there's like a little bit of an odd it feels like this was a moment that was maybe edited. I don't know. Or maybe it's just like they just colored one of the seekers like Starscream by accident again. Well, I did go back and watch that to look for that. And Starscream is definitely in the shot when Megatron says they're going to Washington, D.C. But like everyone like transforms and leaves. But Starscream just stands there. So oh, it's, okay. it's not a continuity error, but it, they did. They didn't make it very clear. Got it. Okay. So now we cut back to the Autobots who have rendezvous with Prime and are almost to DC already. Again, <laughs> let's presume Skyfire <laughs> flew them almost all the way there instead of them driving across country just for my sanity's sake. <laughs> it's like it's like Skyfire doesn't want them to like lose their self confidence. It's like, well, I'm not going to fly you all the way there. He's You're always drive making yourself... excuses to drop them off uh, six blocks from where they need to go. Hey, yeah. you guys, uh, I got to recharge. Let me drop you off here so you guys can handle the rest of the route, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, Skylinks needs to take his driver's test, and I decided I'd help him practice. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, then Spike reminds Prime that they need to rescue Wheeljack, and he assigns this task to Spike and Bumblebee as the other Autobots continue on their way. Yeah, so... I feel like this 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 feels like a big moment for me because Optimus specifically says I want you two to free Wheeljack. He says I want you two to free. He's sending Bumblebee and Spike on a rescue mission on their own, right? Yeah. This is something that he would not have done even as recently as the Ultimate Doom. But Spike has proved himself over and over again. Bumblebee's proved himself especially after Attack of the Autobots. So it's like, yeah, he's got confidence in him now. You know, I'm going to send you on like the A-list missions and Prowl's over there going like, "Hey, what?" But I Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know. It's just it's it's so casual the way he's like, I want you guys to free him. I'm like, wow. And and, and Bobby even says, like, thanks. I was looking for a way to help out. We're in a new era of the Transformers with that one line, it, by my reckoning. So we cut to DC where the Decepticons minus Starscream and Nurgle's troops are running roughshod through the streets. The sub Atlanticans have this big computer device in the streets, which they're going to use to put a force field dome around DC. And Megatron instructs the sub Atlantican to fire it up. And then the sub Atlantican says he only takes orders from Nurgle. But Megatron points out that Nurgle isn't here, and he is, so do what he says. <laughs> and we see the sub Atlantican realize that picking a fight with a 20 foot robot with a cannon on his arm is probably not a good idea. Mm hmm cut back to the Autobots and we see them pull into the city just before the dome comes down. Megatron declares that DC is his, but Prime is here to retort, not if I can help it, as he, Brawn, Prowl, Sunstreaker, and Ironhide all transform. And a fight breaks out, but can we please talk about that amazing shot of Thundercracker mm -hmm. winding up to fire at I'm always happy to talk about shots of Thundercracker. I encourage everybody, if you're watching this episode and if you're tuning in and out, Pause in this moment when Thundercracker like offers a threat to the Autobots and then raises his arm and fires because it's, it's a gorgeous shot. He's he's drawn so well. The composition is great. The colors are fantastic, like the background colors. And I mean, just look at that twisted. Like he's got like the shoulders in opposition to the waist, and he's got his legs all like he's stepping forward while also throwing his shoulder back. Just everything about that image, even like if you pause it, it looks like he's breathing. It's just so <laughs> full of movement. So, like, this is what I'm talking about. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about whenever we talk about, like, how you can have limited animation, but if you have great staging, great compositions, and great poses, 
man, it, it'll, it'll fill in so many of the gaps for you. Cause like that, this was arresting when I watched it again. Yeah. I mean, obviously I don't have the art training that you have had, but I mean, I did have how to draw comics the Marvel way. And this really reminds me of that. It's like, you know, Thundercracker isn't just standing there lifting his arm. <laughs> He's like, leaning yes. forward and twisting his upper body, so it's really it's really dynamic. Yeah, there's just a ton of movement in it. Compare that to like how it would have been drawn in City of Steel, right? Oh you god, I don't even drawn. want to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah, it's just it's just so pretty. This episode is really nice to look at. So yeah, this battle breaks out, and and this is another thing. It's mostly them just like across the street from each other shooting at each other, but it still mm-hmm. looks great because the way they framed everything up. Yeah, there's lots of explosions and a weird scene where Hound and Prowl run backwards through what Google tells me is called the Tidal Basin near the Washington Monument as mm-hmm. Hound shouts, What's your aim, guys? We don't want to blow away any history! I couldn't really tell if that running backwards was intentional or an animation error. Cause I read that as them, I read that as them like sort of falling back, like they're on the defensive. Like and they're they're firing, but they're continuing to like step backwards to like you know gain gain some ground between them and the enemy. It does seem like it was intended that way, but it almost looks like it was just like shot with them running forward and then reversed, and that's not really how <laughs> running backwards works. <laughs> but Hound doesn't want to blow away any history because yes, they are yes they're near the Washington Monument right now, and that mm-hmm. whole area of Washington D.C. is full of architectural and cultural treasures. Yeah, this is much like when everybody went to New York City and City of Still. You see lots of easily identifiable landmarks of Washington, yeah. D.C. drawn here. And actually, they're not very far from the Lincoln Memorial right now. Yeah. Which so it's a good to. thing that Cliff Jumper isn't here, because if he was, <laughs> he probably would accidentally blow away some history. <laughs> oh, there there goes the Lincoln Memorial. Oh, there goes the, <laughs> the Vietnam Memorial. Cliff Jumper. <laughs> There's a weird-looking Decepticon sitting on a chair over there. Choo-choo-choo! Cliff Jumper, that was the Lincoln Memorial. Oh. Oh, Cliff Jumper, that was the Air and Space Museum. Well, it sure looked like a Decepticon. Yes, it's full of planes! (laughs) So then Soundwave ejects Laserbeak, who strafes them, and Hound retorts, Now Laserbeak is history, too, and shoots him out of the air. Ah, Hound, you and your dad jokes. (laughs) So we cut back to Bumblebee and Spike who's back in his scuba gear, in the water, trying to break into Subatlantica, and they're lamenting that they can't get through the force field dome, but Bumblebee says maybe they can go under the dome as they dive underneath the water and swim into the bottom of the Subatlantican base. So the shield only goes to the surface of the water. Yeah. Um, I buy it. I mean, these people, they are hostile towards the land slugs. They clearly have disdain for them, so they probably think, well, there's no way they would go in the water because they were, that, that, that's our realm. That we're superior there, so why would they even think about going that way? I also feel it's sort of a trope where it's like force fields are only on the top of things, and if you yeah. like dig underground, you can just get in there easily. Yeah, I can't think true. of any examples offhand, but I know I've seen that numerous times before. When, if you think about it, like for a little bit longer, any en- energy barrier is already traveling through matter, i.e. air. So it, it seems reasonable that it could like actually go through the ground or water as well to protect the bottom of something. But we got a story to tell and we got to tell it fast. <laughs> we got 21 minutes. Uh, and, and we should say that this, this forest field barrier is like impenetrable. Like the Autobots tried to break through it. They can't. Mm-hmm. So th- that's that's the foreshadow of what's coming up next. There's a great, great, great scene coming up next. <laughs> but yeah, so they 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 go inside to start looking for Wheeljack, and what do we find? So we cut to Nergal bragging about his magnetic dysfunction ray that he's used to immobilize Wheeljack. Oh no, Wheeljack's no. immobilized again. <laughs> then Wheeljack turns to the camera. This keeps happening. <laughs> <laughs> But then Starscream emerges, demanding the weapon. But then Nergil shoots him too, causing him to be almost as helpless as Wheeljack. No, Nergil proclaims that the weapon doesn't work on Decepticons as well as it does on Autobots, but it'll work good enough. So now Starscream and Wheeljack are both depicted like they're being electrocuted. They're gl- like glowing yellow. Mm-hmm. Nergil laughs and exits the room. Bumblebee and Spike see Nergo leave, and they sneak in. And by the way, Spike's back in his regular clothes now, so <laughs> I guess in a fanny pack on his Speedo or something, he had his 
regular clothes to turn into. Well, I mean, this this goes back to my theory about Teletran 1, like manufacturing clothes for Spike. And actually, we're approaching an interesting potential theory as to why Spike's always dressed the same, right? Because like if Teletran 1's making his clothes, he's like, well, explore, explore. And he scans Spike once, like, there's your outfit. I'm just gonna be making you new clothes. And then Spike's like, well, come on, Dad, can I just get, you know, they, they got the, these new pants that have zebra stripes and they're like, they, they balloon out of the top. And that guy on the television who says, you can't touch this, wears them. I really want to try them out. <laughs> Spark plug's like, you know how much those cost? Teletrans making you pants for free. You're going to wear the blue pants <laughs> and the tan shirt. You're always running off of the Autobots. You're not working on any oil tankers anymore. So <laughs> you're not pulling your weight, kid. You get your free clothes from Teletran 1. But but because it's Cybertronian technology and you got mass shifting, well, now we've got some Barry Allen, the Flash kind of thing going on where Spike can have a belt buckle uh, that he just opens up and boom, outfit. I'll allow it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so they come into the room mm-hmm. and what the heck is Starscream doing here? There's this weird bit of business the Starscream, like, he's being electrocuted, and as Nurgil said, it doesn't work as well on him as it does on Wheeljack. So Wheeljack's paralyzed, but Starscream's kind of crawling around, and he, like, mm-hmm. crawls up to Wheeljack and starts doing something. Yeah, he's like a... He opens up Wheeljack's chest and starts attaching a wire, and Bumblebee exclaims, No! That could ruin Wheeljack's function circuitry! Okay. I'll take your word for it, <laughs> Bumblebee, because it's completely unclear what Starscream is doing here. But Starscream retorts to that and says, Oh, what? Ruining Autobots is my life! So Starscream then runs at the pair, and we see Bumblebee react in fear, but then what does he do, Jersey? Oh my gosh, he's so great. <laughs> this is why Optimus sent him, because he bum rushes Starscream. Now, remember the last time we saw something like this happen? It was in the Ultimate Doom, and we saw Brawn take out like two or three Seekers just by running into their knees and pushing them. And so Bumblebee watched. He paid attention. He learned. He asked himself what would Brawn do, and he did it. Starscream, the number two Decepticon, pushed him in the knees, felled him. Way to go, Bumblebee. <laughs> and Bumblebee, he, even he says, he's like, what, did I do that? Yeah. Even Bumblebee is shocked at what he's done. And Spike calls him over to help bring Wheeljack back online. And they get Wheeljack conscious. And he says that they need to stop Nurgil before it's too late. So Nurgil enters DC as Wheeljack, Bumblebee, and Spike <laughs> just sneak in behind him. <laughs> <It's a> really, <laughs> they totally do. They totally really tiptoe scene. into the room. <laughs> <laughs> so then Thundercracker and Skywarp are strafing Hound and Prowl as Brawn runs up to assist, and he manages to shoot out some sort of cable that attaches to Thundercracker and keeps him tethered, allowing Prime to shoot him down. Yeah, this is an interesting sort of, I wouldn't call this imaginative fight scene, but like there, it's just, it's interesting that like Brawn sort of lassoes thundercracker and then like attaches the other end of the rope to the washington monument so then thundercracker kind of like does this little bit of like gets stuck in the air and he's like oh well i guess i'm flying in a circle now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which i mean it, it's not tell it's not communicated that way like you don't hear john stevenson say anything but it just mm-hmm. it feels like that feels really appropriate to the character <laughs> <laughs> and then like while he's flying in a circle trying to figure out okay how do i get out of this rope optimus just like picks him off so now Nurgle arrives to finish the job, and he shoots Prime, causing Prime to collapse to the ground with that same electrostatic buzz that Wheeljack and Starscream had. Prowl, Brawn, and Hound all run up to help Prime, but Nurgle shoots them too, so they're all on the ground now. Megatron is impressed, as Nurgle states, Today, Washington, D.C., tomorrow the entire planet. And we cut to Wheeljack and Bumblebee racing the streets. Wheeljack radios Prime about Nurgle's dysfunction, Ray. But it's too late, dude. Prime and the others are all writhing on the ground, taking us to a commercial break. Another really awesome moment to end on visually, where we see Optimus trying to get up as he hears Wheeljack's radio telecommunique, as it were. <laughs> and then prime struggles and then we just see like his hand kind of like like unclenching as he's like laying on the ground being electrocuted and then it just fades to black there what a way to end the scene all the good guys are beaten bad guys are standing over them wheeljack too late is telling him you're going to get electrocuted it's everything is bad about that moment and it's just visually it's so pretty so 
okay, I'm feeling like I'm going to go in the backyard and pretend that I'm staging an Autobot rescue of my own <laughs> with my friends and my Entertech squirt guns. Uh. <laughs> the look, the feel, the sound, so real. <laughs> God! The look, the feel, the sound, so real. This does not feel comfortable in the 21st century. <laughs> Children running around with these very realistic guns. Mixed feelings, Hoover. As a child, I thought it was amazing because they, they weight, they were heavy. Mm-hmm. There was recoil when you used the gun. It made like machine gun noises while you're squirting your friends. So it felt like this is the most advanced summertime play that I've ever experienced, you know? Mm-hmm. But as an adult, watching those kids run by the screen with these really real looking guns, whoo! Like, and, <laughs> and it's before anybody gets like, you know, thinking that I'm taking some kind of position on, on gun rights, I'm not talking about hunting. <laughs> these kids, these kids are like, they're equipped to murder people. <laughs> This is all about combat. <laughs> I certainly had a very, very realistic toy Uzi that I used while playing G.I. Joe, pretending I was Snake Eyes, and there was no orange tip on it or anything. This was no. pre-that, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Back in the 80s, kids, you could get realistic-looking guns. And you can go to Toy Galaxy to see a very brief mm-hmm. video that explains the short lifespan of Entertech guns, rightly so. <laughs> yep. Good Lord. So, okay, let's dial it back. Let's maybe, let's not do something that's quite so literal one-to-one transfer from fantasy to reality. Maybe something where the violence is more abstract and fantastical, like Cobra Khan. Mm, he man, he man. The evil Mr. Cobra Khan has you under my power. I, Stratos, will obey. He man, Stratos, and Cobra Khan each sold separately. Your evil mist won't make a slave of He-Man. Oh, yeah? One more blast of my hypnotizing mist, and now you're going to see real power, Cobra Khan. <laughs> he's, well, actually, he's spraying poison on people. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very good either. So that's a little, still a little too intense. Hoover, get me out of here. <laughs> well, how about Dr. Mindbender riding the Cobra Hydro Sled? Cobra's got a new Hydro Sled, and that's real dangerous with G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe. The music is exciting. The imagery is not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laying on my stomach. I'm on a Hydro Sled. <laughs> How could the imagery of Dr. Mindbender not be exciting? He's got a monocle and a cape. <laughs> and a stick of gum. And he's coming for you. <laughs> uh, we'll get to the stick of gum when we do our G.I. Joe podcast series <laughs> in 2024. Okay, so let's get maybe let's just get back to the show. So what, what do we see when we come back? We return to see Wheeljack, Bumblebee, and Spike all discovering that their friends are shorting out on the ground. Maybe it's time to call in reinforcements. Wheeljack radios the Dinobots for help, and Grimlock makes the choice to go help. Yeah, and now I feel like this episode signals the shift from Grimlock being like resentful brute to being more cheerful, joyful. But he still has a little bit of the whole like I'm better than you. Like yeah. he's like, oh, you guys always call us, and there's like too much trouble. You know, I gotta pull your fat out of the fire. Whatever he says later mm-hmm. on in the episode, but. But it's still, he feels more cheerful, relatively speaking, to how he felt in SOS Dinobots and War of the Dinobots, right? Yeah. I think he's more almost like joyous to show off. It, yeah. It sort of fits with his character that uh, he's got to save the Autobots again. You know, he's yeah. now happy to help because it will allow him to show off his abilities. Yeah, you're right. You're right. He's grumbling about it, but at the same time, he likes to prove to them that he that they the Dinobots are so superior. So, but but it's also yeah, but it it, it he feels like we're starting to see the transition to where we get to by the end of season three, where he's much more of a silly character. Mm-hmm. Verdict's still out on that for me. How I feel about that, but as it, I'll, I'm waiting to see how watching these episodes one at a time changes my perception of this, but. So yeah, I've talked about this before in Heavy Metal War. There's something I find so incredibly charming about the idea of there are these great big giant brutes that stay home 
And if you're in trouble, they will come out and they will hurt people for you. <laughs> <laughs> the Autobots are all taken out. We need somebody to come in here and hurt these bad guys. Okay. And then <laughs> in come the big cute monsters, you know. <laughs> well, now we cut to Nurgle taking over the Capitol building where an officer, probably the one Megatron yelled at earlier, asks him how long they have to put up with the Decepticons. And Nurgle says it won't be too much longer before they can be disposed of. And meanwhile, at the Lincoln Memorial, we see Megatron removing the statue of Lincoln from the chair as if it were simply two separate pieces. <laughs> and then Megatron sits in the chair, surveying all he has conquered. Thundercracker comes up and asks them how long they'll have to put up with the Subatlanticans. And Megatron says, We will soon put them in their proper place, the bottom of the sea. So are you getting it, kids? Bad guys don't like bad guys, and they're going to turn on each other. You can never trust bad guys. Bad guys can't even trust bad guys. I I feel like this is making a pretty good case for young people for like modeling activities or modeling behaviors, right? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, Megatron and Soundwave, they're pretty cool. They're really cool. You know, it's the problem with those cool guys. You can't trust them. They're always going to turn on you. And, mm -hmm. you know, the people who flock to those cool guys, they can't be trusted. You know who can be trusted? Chip Chase. That's who can be trusted. <laughs> He's a nerd. I, I, I'm sorry. I had to do it. But but the other thing I like about this scene is, like, when Megatron takes Lincoln off of the Lincoln Memorial, you see him, like, carefully set it down. Like, he doesn't, like, throw it. He, like, he just, like, leans over the side, like, oh, I'll put this over here. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, I like it because, like, well... When everything gets set right at the end of the episode, which it has to be, we can't have a broken Lincoln on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Even Megatron knows, but it, it, was, it was a cute moment of animation that I just noticed, and I thought, oh, how nice of them that they kept that in there. <laughs> so here come the Dinobots. Yep, we cut to them arriving on the outskirts of DC, but they're blocked by the Energy Dome. But not for long, as their sheer power allows it to be shattered like glass, allowing them to enter the city. This is what I'm talking about. I love this. I love that they've established that like the Autobots couldn't break through it. You know, even Optimus can't break mm -hmm. through it. It's an impenetrable force field. Well, Grimlock's just gonna ram it enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then and then Slag is just gonna like jump through the crack and fully smash it open. These guys are savage and it's so lucky. They're like you and I have had this conversation off mic about like Guy Gardner in the nineties Justice League comics. It's like mm -hmm. A real drag to have around the base when you're not doing battle. But when there's a battle, boy, are you glad that Guy Gardner is there, right? <laughs> because he is so savage, so brutal, and so careless that you know he's going to put the bad guy on their heels, right? But then, yeah, the bad guys go home. And it's like, oh, no, what are we, we going to do with this Guy Gardner guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the JLI never had a closet they could just keep him in. <laughs> <laughs> The Dinobots give me exactly the same feeling of like this this joyous rampage of okay everything's really bad. Wouldn't it be nice if a giant monster came in and stomped on everybody to make it better? And that's what's <laughs> happening. So we see Swoop take out Laser Beacon Buzzsaw, and Snarl takes out Starscream by knocking his missile back his way. So then Grimlock finds Prime and tells him that he's here to pull his diodes out of the fire. But then Megatron arrives on the scene, determined to stop him. And we mm. then get a pretty decent Grimlock versus Megatron battle. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if you counted, but Grimlock took three full shots from Megatron's fusion cannon and just mm -hmm. kept coming at him. Right? Three direct hits. And Megatron's mm -hmm. rushing him in dino mode. Like, they just that's the kind of thing that I, I maybe we wouldn't have, like, said it out loud as children, but boy, oh boy, does that mean something when you're watching it during a battle scene, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, they don't have to draw attention. Megatron's not saying like, why won't you fall? You know, he's just he's right. shooting and Grimlock's just bum rushing him. Yeah, it's it's totally that moment in pro wrestling when like the, the, the face is getting slammed by the heel and then like the face's friends come into the ring, you know? <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Like, yeah. like Hillbilly Jim would suddenly jump in there to like help Hulk Hogan. And he'd be like, all right, it's going to get great now. <laughs> <laughs> and then Nurgle runs up and tries to shoot Grimlock, but Megatron and Grimlock are grappling so tightly that he declares that he'll have to shoot them both. And that's mm -hmm. when Starscream runs up behind Nurgle and takes him out, grabbing his weapon and exposing his treachery. Starscream hates treachery. <laughs> Unless he's doing it. <laughs> That's right. He is like the biggest POS in Transformers history. <laughs> so cut to Bumblebee and Wheeljack, and they have a plan. Speeding down the road, they both duke boys into Starscream <laughs> and grab Nurgle's gun from them. 
<laughs> Duke Boising is always permitted when A, it's Bumblebee, and B, it's hitting Starscream in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I will never question how they did it. I'll be like, okay, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Any other time, I'll be like, oh, come on, put a ramp in there or something. So they grab Nurgle's gun and toss it over towards Grimlock. And Grimlock <laughs> then transforms to robot mode and says, not bad for Autobots. And he snaps Nurgle's weapon in half. It's a very quick piece of animation here where as it's exploding, he's kind of holding it at arm's length. And you actually hear Greg Berger do like a little grunt. Like, so like... I don't know. It's 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 a tiny piece of acting, but it's just it's kind of cool that it's selling this idea that well they had to give it to Grimlock because when this thing goes off, it would decimate any other Autobot. So because it, mm. it's even making Grimlock, who took three full shots from Megatron, grunt in pain as it's exploding in his face. Hmm. And once the weapon is destroyed, it frees the incapacitated Autobots. Thankfully, as they all get up to join the fight, and Megatron blames Starscream for their revival. <laughs> Starscream, see what you've done, you trembling dirt. Okay, I have to stop and ask, how much does Hoover love this? Starscream <laughs> was trying to help the boss. <laughs> and of course, yeah, it got out of his hands because it's Starscream. But then that Megatron, instead of being like, well, he was doing his best. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sentence that Megatron has never uttered. <laughs> That's true. So he turns to Starscream, who, again, was trying to help him because he was going to get shot by Nergil. And he he chews him out. Like he stops <laughs> stops fighting long enough to chew out Starscream. Like that <laughs> that guy cannot win. <laughs> so then Nergil retreats back to Subatlantica and Megatron 2 knows that it's not a great idea to stick around. But before he goes, he wants to keep the Autobots busy. So he punches the Washington Monument, literally <laughs> knocking it over. And Prime runs up to catch it and keep it from falling. Then Grimlock pitches in behind him, and the two are able to get it to stand back up. Then Slag uses his fire breath to seal the cracks, and voila, it's all like new. That's all you need to fix a cracked monument is some fire breath. Just call a Dinobot. In their later years, they went into contracting. <laughs> the Autobots and Dinobots all regroup and get ready to take the fight to Subatlantica. And we see Ironhide and Ratchet, not sure when he arrived, place the Lincoln <laughs> statue back on its throne, and the Autobots roll out. I love that they took the time to show the <laughs> Autobots putting the Lincoln Memorial back together. Oh my gosh. It's it's like, what, two seconds of animation, right? It was mm, like... If that. One could argue it's really not critical to show that, but it's just, it's one of those things where if I were editing this episode, we'd see Ironhide and Ratchet picking it up or rather, like, walking by the monument, and, like, one of them would look over and see Spike, and they'd be like, ah, oh, pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to say something. <laughs> it makes me wonder if there was any pushback after the episode where they drove to Africa and left all that rubble yeah. there after that little conflict. It's like, right, uh, can we have the Autobots <laughs> clean up after themselves, maybe? Well, or, or like in universe explanation is like they got home and Chip and Spike are like, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> no, you go back there, you clean it up. <laughs> like, oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, I guess we should do that too. <laughs> so now we cut to Nergo and the Decepticons piloting Subalantica back out to the sea. Megatron wants Nergil to answer Starscream's charge of treachery, but there's no time for that. There's Autobot cars on water skis to deal with. Nergil's troops emerge to fend off the attack of the Autobots as Prime pulls up and spins around, opening up his trailer. Because Roller is going to single-handedly defeat Subatlantica! Alright! No, oh, just kidding. Oh... Out of Prime's trailer walk the Dinobots, as Prime tells them, Okay, Grimlock, time for you and the Dinobots to act prehistoric. Yeah, see, I love this. I love the idea of, again, the big happy monsters coming to help by wrecking up the place. <laughs> and it's fully sanctioned by the boss. Act prehistoric. Ruin everything. These guys are jerks. They had it coming. So the Dinobots start wrecking shop bringing Megatron out to challenge them. Yeah, and Megatron says something like, oh, you don't frighten me. And then Grimlock says, oh, that's good. We love stupid enemies. So <laughs> again, there's all this macho braggadocio. 
And it's not, it's like, it's a perfect line for him because it's not very clever, right? It's, it's, but it, but it delivers what it needs to deliver in that. Like he's, he's big, he's macho and he likes to fight. <laughs> but rather than see his city destroyed by the Dinobots, Nurgle plans to use the Energon Cube stores to blow up the entire city. <laughs> Spike, Wheeljack, and Bumblebee give chase after overhearing his plan. So we're back to the, the sneaky three. That's their special <laughs> club name. <Yes. laughs> <sighs> but Soundwave sees the Autobots and he launches out Rumble and Ravage to stop them. Mm. And then Bumblebee's trio finds Nurgle ready to blow up the base rather than surrender as he prepares to flip the switch that will destroy his city with everyone on it. Rumble and Ravage overhear these plans and confirm that Nurgle can't be trusted, so Rumble uses his pile drivers to knock Nurgle down from the scaffolding that he's on. So this is a little cool moment where it's like suddenly the Autobots and Decepticons have a common enemy. Yeah, and I wish there was more time in this episode because I feel like it gets there with Rumble being like, oh, he can blow himself up someplace else and he mm-hmm. hits the wall and knocks him down. But I, I, it would have been, I think, a little bit more fun if there was a moment where the good guys and bad guys looked at each other and said, like, okay, what do we do about this? Right, you know? yeah. I always love those kind of scenes. Oh, I do too. Like if Rumble ran up to Wheeljack and said, throw me up there. You know, and then like yeah. be like, do it, and then the Rumble flies up and hits Nurgle in the face of this pal driver or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or even, you know, it'd be really really cute is like if Ravage came up with the plan and then Rumble had to translate for Ravage to <laughs> like, <laughs> like Ravage goes up, he's like, hide, hide, hide. I'm like what? I don't understand. He, is he actually talking? Yeah, you didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> See, you guys don't pay attention very much. If you just stopped and listened just for a few seconds, maybe you'd understand our point of view a little bit more. You know what? I think you're right. <laughs> what do you think he is, a zap mouse? <laughs> <laughs> and this is issue six of Trapped in a Room. <laughs> trapped in a Cave. Rumble, <laughs> Trapped in a Cave, Rumble, Ravage, and Wheeljack <laughs> edition. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So Rumble's tactic delays him, but not enough as Nurgle just runs back up to the switch. Wheeljack catches him, but not before Nurgle can start the chain reaction. Bumblebee radios Prime that Sublantica is about to explode, and Prime orders an evacuation. And here we see Ratchet, Trailbreaker, Sideswipe, and Sunstreaker, so I guess more cavalry has arrived off screen. Mm-hmm. And we get this lovely shot of Prime getting the radio call. Yeah, I mean, just look at that. I encourage everybody to pause this scene because you got this this gorgeous yellow sky with like the clouds behind them, and then like got like the 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 blue sort of mechanical skyline of Sub Atlantica, and then this really just gorgeous uh, like sort of like upshot of Prime standing there as he's contemplating. Okay, we got to get out of here. Man, this episode is just so full of really well composed, beautiful shots, beautifully drawn, and really terrific color in this one. Yep. It's, it's worth watching again just to look at the colors and the compositions, man. Yep, and now Megatron is likewise ordering his troops to escape, and they all take off. Prime comes running in to rescue Bumblebee's trio, and he's surprised to find Grimlock has shown up for the rescue as well. And Grimlock says he's always the one there to save Autobot Hyde. Yeah, this this is one clumsy line in the episode is when Prime's like, I didn't expect to see you here. I'm like, Why? <laughs> <laughs> What's so surprising about Grimlock being there? Well, I think it was because he ordered Grimlock to wreck up the place, and he didn't expect uh, Grimlock to go over, achieve, and wreck up the place and try to save some other Autobots. I see. Okay, okay. So it just sort of like fleshes out Grimlock's character where he's sort of becoming more and more Autobot-like to me. Mm, hmm Yeah. Yeah, He now, now he doesn't just wreck up the place. Now he saves friends, too. Yeah. So the yeah. remaining Autobots manage to escape sub just in time to avoid getting blown up with it. And we see them popping up to the surface, and Spike oddly exclaims, Hey, Nurgle's gone! <laughs> I guess because the last time we saw him, he was, like, in Wheeljack's hand. and Yeah. I guess he managed to escape, so... And I think they specifically put that in there to placate the censors, as in, we're supposed to take it as Nurgle got away... Rather than, oh, he killed himself, you know. So it's Right. Like, yeah. This is where one of those things where, like, in order to make it, quote unquote, accessible to young kids, they short circuit some of the drama of this series. Because it really was, he spiraled into madness pretty darn quick. 
and he literally says, I'm going to blow up the city and everybody on it. Well, yeah. he's going to kill himself and everybody else, you know? And I don't know. I don't know. I guess I, I would I would have to have a discussion with like some child psychologists, but it's like I could make the argument that if they let him blow himself up, there's this whole idea of like evil destroying itself kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I, I also, you know, it's like I, I acknowledge that I probably have some blind spots here. I work with children all the time. I'm a teacher, but I'm not a child psychologist. So that, I'm sure they got some guidance from some people on this that like possibly have more education than me. <laughs> so, but, but it, it does in the end, it makes it like, you know, I guess, I guess it's ambiguous because Spike says Nurgle's gone, mm-hmm. you know? So, like you said, it's like suggesting he got away, or you can accept the fact that he blew himself up. So then the Autobots watch Subatlantica explode and sink into the sea. Prime says that he doesn't think they'll be hearing from Nurgil for a long time. And Spike says, I only wish we could say the same thing about the Decepticons as the screen <laughs> fades to black. <laughs> so, Jersey... You'll notice that mm-hmm. we never saw Frenzy this episode. Do you know why? Um, were we supposed to? Well, we're always supposed to because Frenzy is awesome. <laughs> yes, but, that's not optional. <laughs> but Soundwave went to DC and Frenzy was like, hey, we're in we're in Washington, DC. Is that right? He's like, yeah. And, and Frenzy's like, hey, Soundwave, can you eject me real quick? And then uh-huh. he does. And Frenzy runs off. It turns out Frenzy went to Discord Records to see the oh. famous building, the famous record label of Minor Threat and so many other punk bands. He wanted to uh-huh. see that porch that Minor Threat was photographed on. He was yeah. like, hey, I'm finally in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Usually we're just all, all over the earth, but now I can visit this place, the birth of this punk rock music. <laughs> yeah. So is, is this the last time we see Frenzy? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually that- not, but that, that would be fun. Uh. That would be that would be a pretty cool fan, and he's hanging out with Ian. You know, <laughs> you told me you like the taste. <laughs> say it, say it, Ian. <laughs> so many listeners do not understand what I just said, but that's okay. It's just having fun. <laughs> There's a record label in Washington D.C. That's all you need to know. Yeah, that is that is very true. So yeah, there there we are. We're at the end, and Sub Atlantica is destroyed, and I don't think we ever see these people again. <laughs> nope, not a bit. Okay, <laughs> good to know. Yeah, so how do you feel about it at the end? Well, it's definitely not completely problem free, but it's pretty darn good, and definitely better than I remembered. And the animation is really good. Characters look great. There's these occasional great shots that just sort of like happen out of nowhere and you're like you know they sort of take you by surprise it's like prime's getting a radio call that doesn't have to look beautiful but it happens mm-hmm. to so yeah you know, it's really really great. just little moments like that are great so you know consulting my checklist starscream <laughs> got yelled at by megatron that's a check skywarp or thundercracker got a brief chance to shine that's a check for thundercracker okay yeah. it's always fun to see bad guys turn on other bad guys okay that's it's nice to see dinobots used well so all in all, I'm pretty pleased. Yeah, it's a very well-made episode of the show. I'm beginning to suspect that this is going to happen a, a couple more times with episodes that I just like kind of, you know, shrug my shoulders going, yeah, that was a fun one. But mm-hmm. upon a close watch, you just see all the care that went into it. And yeah, every one of these episodes, I, I can't think of an episode of Transformers that I would call like perfection. They all have something right. weird and incongruous in them. You know, Roll For It is one of my very, very favorite episodes. But yeah, that's that whole business of Hound and Mirage sneaking into the the laboratory where they turn into a rock and he turns invisible and they're talking to Rumble and then there's people flying through the sky. It's like it's it's clown time, right? <laughs> but but like there's so much to love in it. And I feel like this is another one where it's like you can tell there was a ton of care. There's a few weird hiccupy parts. But if you were to say like, oh, let's amass a, you know, a top 15, if you're only going to watch these 15 episodes of Transformers watch these i think i'd put this one in there Mm, yeah maybe yeah so it's good to be surprised yeah yeah i'm i i am really enjoying that aspect of this project and i would i would say to any of you know the listeners who uh, want to pursue visual storytelling i think this is a good one to look at and do a lot of still framing Mm, yeah definitely look at the way that they construct a lot of these shots they're really really pretty uh okay well what do we got next 
Next up on the lineup is Day of the Machines. Now, this is an episode that I had next to no memory of. I'm sure that it was one of those ones I had seen, I usually say five times or less, but this one I'd probably seen like three times or less. And I rewatched it recently and I was like, wow, this does not feel that familiar. There's like one element about it that feels familiar. But the rest yeah. was just like, wow, this did not stick in my memory at all. <laughs> it's a strange one. And if I'm not mistaken, the writer of that episode also wrote an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe called Day of the Machines. <laughs> yep. Yep. Cribbing from past scripts, perhaps? We shall see. <laughs> well, yeah, we shall see. But yeah, I am super interested to dive into that one with you because that's one I have a lot of memory of. Mm. Like I videotaped it off of television when I was a kid watched it a lot in some ways it kind of creeped me out in other ways it just felt really silly and weird but yeah i'm i'm excited about picking that one apart so and i guess this is the part where i say you can join us in picking these apart by following along watching an episode every week we we just told you what the next one is so (laughs) before next week watch day of the machines and then you can go to our facebook page and share your thoughts on it or you can, you know, email us at four million years later at gmail dot com. We'll get those emails as well. Both of us get that email. Yep. So you can address it to either one of us or both of us. And then if you enjoy this project and enjoy listening to us, you know, break down these episodes, you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five star rating. And if you are a truly noble Autobot, you will write <laughs> a few sentences about what you like about it. You could even say, you know, it's like, what, what's your favorite Autobot or Decepticon too? That'll make it easy. Now you only have to say two nice things about the show <laughs> and then say, and by the way, Wheeljack is my favorite Transformer or whoever, Huffer, Gears, <laughs> <laughs> Mirage. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Hoover. Another episode down, another mm-hmm. surprisingly good one. So that's a, always a pleasant surprise. Let's hope yep. we can say the same next week, but I'm not <laughs> sure we'll be able to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Until next time, I've been Jersey Droz of four million years later dot com and Jersey Droz on Instagram. And I have been Hoover. Arise from bed. It's time to podcast. Okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com, and if you haven't yet, Please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>